Bible's about is uh, making our walk with the Lord getting closer and uh, getting a little uh, pep in our step, so to speak. And Second, Second Kings chapter 6 takes us to the next step. Remember we started with that first step of salvation where we realized we've been bitten by sin and we're cursed and the wages of sin is death and we look into the bronze serpent and one look is all it takes, amen? And then after that, last night, if you wasn't here, we talked about sanctification, walking with the Lord, separated from and separated unto. And tonight we're going to look at a third step that's very important that we all need to have confidence in. And a lot of people can say, yeah, I got that one. I don't need to worry about that one. But when you get into battle and you get a, that enemy starts coming against you, you're going to need tonight. You're going to need it. And we started with, I'm doing a cute little Baptist revival. So I got all of them starting with an S. Salvation, sanctification, and tonight we're going to our shield. Because we all need a shield. We need a protective hand upon us and around us. We cannot afford to run out on our own and try to serve the Lord. Because we're no match. You realize tonight, as you sit here, if you're saved, you've got three enemies. Satan is against you. The world is against you. And the person you look at in the mirror every morning is against you. And that's your flesh. And we're battling three things tonight. And we wasn't battling them before we got saved. How many of us realize that after you got saved, wow, what just happened? You know, a lot of people present salvation as when you enter in, it's a walk among the flowers and it's all peachy, peachy and calm. But it's actually you signed up for a war. But thank God we're on the winning side. But tonight, though, we need to look at We need a shield. We need protection. And uh, I can tell you right now, I need it. I need it bad. And there's, if any man who's ever preached the gospel, he's been called and he's tried to preach Christ crucified and he's tried to stick with the book and proclaim the truth, especially if you ever went in a foreign mission field and tried to preach the truth, you realize there is an opposition and there is an enemy and it's as real as I'm standing here tonight. That enemy's real. And tonight we need to see that we need that shield in a special way. You say, was that really a step? It's the confidence in the shield that you need. And that's where your peace that passes all understanding comes from. And the Bible gives us a story in 2 Kings chapter number 6. And the Bible picks it up in verse number 8. It says, And the king of Syria, he warred against Israel. And he took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God, which was Elisha, the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for there the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him, and he warned him of, and saved himself there not once nor twice. So this had happened a number of times. So then the Bible says in verse number 11, Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He thought he had a traitor among them. That's what was bothering the king of Syria. He said, some of you are betraying me because there's no way that the Israelites know where I'm going to be. There's no way they know this. The Bible says in verse number 12, one of his servants said, none of us, Lord, none, my Lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel, he telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, and I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. And remember that word. He's in Dothan. That's where he's at. So Elisha is in Dothan. And the Bible says, Therefore the Syrians, they all come with a mass army. Verse number 14. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and they compassed the city about. So at this time, Elisha and the Israelites are surrounded by a host, by an enemy. The Bible says in verse number 15, When the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And the servant said unto him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? In other words, fear had now crippled him. He said, We're in trouble. The mountains are, sur mountains are full of horses and chariots. We're surrounded. What are we going to do? The Bible says in verse 16 that Elisha answered, He said, Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. 
And Elisha prayed and he said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. You know what happened? There was more for Elisha than was against him. There was more, he had more on his side than the king of Syria had on his side. And tonight what a lot of us need to realize, we need to slow down and look at this. We're walking with the Lord and we're trying to serve God and we're in enemy territory. And we need to be honest, this world's not our home. And a lot of us are trying to make heaven on earth. But that's a cliche that's in America and it's not possible. There is no heaven on earth. There is no perfect church. There is no perfect day. There is no perfect marriage. There is no perfect friendship. There's no perfect families, no perfect vacation. There's nothing perfect on this earth because it's all cursed by sin and the God of this world is controlling this thing. But we have somebody for us. Greater is he that was within us than he that is in the world. The Bible says that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And tonight as we need to see that we're walking in the enemy territory, but we're walking with the Lord. He hadn't forsaken us. We're walking with him, just like we talked about last night. But as we're walking with him, we need to realize that there's enemies surrounding us. And there's opposition coming against us. And that's the reason to walk with God sometimes can feel like you're walking through molasses. It can feel like you're going through a struggle. You know, not every, some of you are sitting here tonight and some people are saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah, amen. And that choir singing and they sound pumped up. And some of you are sitting here saying, I'm trying to serve God and I feel like the weight of the world's on me right now. You ever been in church and this guy's shouting and you're sitting there thinking, well, I know I'm saved, but man, I'm dying over here. I'm going through hell by the acre. And you, if you say, I've never experienced that, you need to get in the fight then. Amen. You get in the service for the Lord while before long, you'll feel like the spouts went dry. The heavens have gone silent, and I'm miserable. It's happened. Hey, I've been in Mozambique before, laying in a tent in the village, people getting saved all around me, and me lay down at night and thinking, oh, God, I'm miserable. I want to go home. You say, how can that be? You're over there where your passion's at, where your heart's at. You're supposed to be a preacher. You're supposed to be a missionary. You're supposed to be preaching the gospel because wherever I go, there's opposition always. Always. And so the Bible tells us that in 2 Kings chapter 6, you see the story that Elisha is the man of God. They're in Dothan and, and the enemy comes against them. But then we realize that God is with him in a greater way as the heavenly host surrounds and are ready to deliver the people of God. But as we look at this tonight, we need to see that we need that shield and we need that confidence in that shield. And if you're saved tonight, you don't have to pray for the shield you just have to trust the shield. And until you trust the shield, you're going to be a miserable person. And worry and fear and anxiety is going to cripple you. I promise it will cripple you. So the Bible says that the first thing we need to see and we need to all confess, there is opposition. It's a fact. It's a fact. He says in verse 14 and verse 15, he says that, uh, the king of Syria, he sent hither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and they come past the city. They surrounded them. And when that man woke up the next morning, he seen that host that come past the city with horses and chariots. It's a fact. There was enemies. It's a fact. Going into the uh, age of the epistles in the, in the dispensation of grace. It's a fact. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we do. That's a promise. We do wrestle against principalities, against the rulers of the darkness, against powers. We do wrestle that stuff. And so it's a fact that there is opposition. It's a fact. It's a fact that 1 Peter chapter 5 says that we have an adversary, the devil. The devil is real. Demons are real. The spirit of this world is real. And some people are all depressed because they say America's changing and it's getting worse. Of course it's getting worse. It's going to get worse. The enemy is getting more intense and more intense. So we need to see it's a fact. Opposition is real. And if you're trying to find a place of the Christian life where you have no opposition, you're chasing something that does not exist. It's a fairy tale. And if you're here tonight and you're serving the Lord, you're a Sunday school teacher, you're a preacher, you're trying to witness, you're trying to live for the Lord on your job, or you're a teenager in school and you're trying to live for the Lord, get ready, you will have opposition. I promise you it's a fact. 
And, and uh, as, as I shared with you on Sunday that God's blessed Sandra and I the past few months, we didn't even go to biblical Ephesus. I was able to go to, to Rome and see uh, some of those places where Paul and Peter, where they walked and where they went. And it became real to me. If you look at since the church started and Jesus Christ, when the church started, Satan has fought us every step of the way. He's fought us. And I'll show you how he's worked. And I ain't got him all figured out. But I can tell you this. He started with plan A. He started with, I'll destroy the church. Yeah. And you read church history. And I, I encourage you, you need to read church history. You need to read about the martyrs of the saints. And that what, what the church has went through. For you to have what you have right now. Yeah. You ought to read the history of the, of the word of God. How you got it in English. Amen. How many people shed their blood and died just for us to have a copy of the Word of God in our lap. And we take it for granted, but listen, there was a day, there was a day that the church said the common people are not allowed to have the Word of God. And they wouldn't allow you to have it. But here we have it because some people realize it's worth dying for. And so, that how, plan A, Satan said, opposition, I will destroy them. And that's the reason the disciples, all of them but John, church history tells us, were martyred. Paul was beheaded. Peter crucified upside down. Many saints crucified, burned at the stake. How did that happen? Stoned to death. Because Satan said, I will destroy the church. I will destroy the truth. And not just those, not just those disciples, but for hundreds of years at the beginning, what did Satan try to do? I will persecute. I will persecute. I will quieten the church. I will silence it. I will stop the word of God. And he came with everything he had. But you know what happened when he started persecuting? The church spread. It spread. And it went to Europe and went to Asia and down into North Africa. And here we sit today. You know where it all started? Because some saints were persecuted and it spread. And say, boy, that made Satan mad. And he could, that infuriated him. Do you know what Satan's plan B was? I will join the church. And there was an unholy mixture. And like I shared with you, we got to go to Rome. You know what, you know what happened in about 300 and something A.D.? There was a ruler named Constantine. He was a Roman emperor. He'd seen a vision, he said. And he said, I'll become a Christian. And you know what he did to his whole army? He demanded and commanded they all be baptized. And he said, I will make Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire. But you can't make somebody saved. You can't make somebody serve God. So what the opposition do? The opposition created an unholy mixture. We're still seeing some of that today. That's right. But, so that worked for a while. And then the church became unholy. A lot of the church for hundreds of years, you had corruption in the pulpit, corruption in the ministry, and corruption among the church, and, and on and on and went. And, and that battle went on and on and on. And then you bring it even to present day. And I believe we can all testify if you're in America today and you're trying to serve God and you're in the ministry and you talk to the saints long enough, you see, Satan's now come with plan C. You know what plan C is? I'll attack the mind. I'll launch everything I've got between their ears. He said, they can sit in church and they can have their Bible and they can sing their songs and do all they want to, but I'm going to discourage them. I'm going to defeat them. I'm going to fill them with doubt. I'm going to fill them with depression. I'm going to fill them with downheartedness. And you know what, we're, you know what the face of the church is now? And the face of the church is I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of the king. Glory to God. I'm a child of the king. That's what it's turned into. And we're saying, boy, I wish we'd get young people in here. Young people will never dart the doors with your long face. And you say, boy, we got the joy of the Lord. No, I don't think you do. And he stomps that battle on the mind. And this, I'm not, I'm not criticizing you. I'm one. I'm one. I'm just like you. Boy, he, he attacks my mind and wrings it out like a sponge sometimes. And we need to, so the first point we need to make tonight is, can we all testify and confess that just as Elisha was in Dothan and they were surrounded, he said, he looked up, that, that servant of the man of God went outside and he said, Elisha, you ain't going to believe this. We're surrounded. There's an enemy out there, Elisha. What are we going to do? I'm nervous. I'm scared. A lot of people, a lot of preachers have quit preaching. 
Their enemy is alive and well. And he's on the warpath. And he's fighting us with everything he's got. He's fighting Preacher Fenoy tonight. You say, well, he don't seem to be bothered. Every time he comes in there, he's shouting the house down and he's happy and shaking hands. Well, he's trying to encourage you, but behind closed doors, he's getting beat too. Satan's attacking him too. Hey, there ain't a man that you say, well, so-and-so over there, he's been leading singing. He's 93 years old, done singing schools for 50 years. Hey, don't bother him. He fights it too. And if any man or any woman tells you they don't fight it, they're lying. They're trying to be super saint. But he shoots at us. Fiery darts coming at us. There is opposition. Just as, just as Elisha was fought then, we're fought too. But tonight we need to see we don't need to quit right there though. There is a shield for us. So that that opposition is something we all need to come to grips with. Since I've been saved, man, I fought. Satan's fought me. I can, te I can, I can tell you stories that you would not believe. Since I've gotten the ministry, it's gotten worse. Since I started going to Africa, it got even more worse. You know what I've come to realize? The more I do for the Lord, the more he fights. The more he fights. But some people are sitting in church pews and they're trying to get to a point where they have no more battle. You're chasing something you'll never get. You say, well, let's just all go home now and be depressed. <laughs> oh, but the story ain't over right there. We have an opposition, but then the Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 6, we go to the next part. He says in verse 16, but that famous two words, it's all throughout your King James Bible, fear not. Aren't you glad he said fear not? Yeah. Elisha said in verse 16 when he heard what's going on out there, then he says, but fear not. When he said fear not, he didn't just say don't fear, but he gave him a reason not to fear. And the reason was, look around. The reason you don't need to fear is because there's more for us than they are against us. Right. And tonight I want to tell you something. Yeah. Fear not. Yeah. Yeah. Fear not. And you say, well, I don't fear. I just got a problem with worry. Worry is fear. Right. You know why you worry? Because you're scared of something. No. Worry is a product of fear. And our churches are full of worry. Now, I'm not going to put you in bondage tonight and say every time you worry is a sin, but we need to realize worry is defeat. And there's two opposite sides of the same coin, faith and fear. And you can't have them both honest. You got one side or the other. Faith or fear. And fear and worry don't go with faith. And so tonight we need to see this. Why should we not fear? Because there's more for us than against us. You say, well, I, they don't mean there's a whole host of angels, but boy, I'm living in the day of grace, and guess what he told me? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Who's in me? Oh, that's the precious Holy Ghost. He's in me. There's a power in me that's not in the world. And boy, Satan does fight me sometimes, and sometimes it seems like he's in my bedroom. I ain't talking about Sandra either, so don't y'all go picking on her. Listen, hey, sometimes it feels like he's attacking me with everything he's got, and he's shooting fiery dart after fiery dart after fiery dart. And you feel like you can't get any peace, and no matter what you do, you can't pray. It's like you can't move. You can't, it's like it's so thick. You need to realize there's more for you than against you. Amen. Greater is he that is in you than the he's in this world. Do you believe the Bible when he says that we have a friend yes, that sticketh closer yes, than a brother? Yes. Do you believe the Bible when Jesus yes. says, in this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Yes. And he didn't stop right there. Yes. He said, because I have overcome the world. So tonight, yes, we were. Yes, we have fear. And your battle may be different than my battle. And you wouldn't want to get up here tonight and confess your battle because it would probably, you know, it embarrass you. You think, I don't want to tell people the doubts I have or the fears I have or the worries I have. Satan makes me think saying sometimes that I, it's embarrassing even to tell God what I'm thinking. How Satan can take your mind in places you never thought it would go and make you believe things you never thought you'd believe. And then the next thing you know, but we need to realize, he said, fear not. And he said, fear not for a reason, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And Elisha said, listen, he told his servant, he said, listen, I know there's a, heavenly, there's a big bunch out there, but you don't need to worry because there's far more for us than there are for them. It's kind of like, you remember what it was like when you used to be scared and you're walking around with your dad or somebody 
and you're scared. I used to be scared. My dad, I remember growing up that we didn't have a shower in our house. And my dad rigged this shower in the basement. So we had to go downstairs in the basement to take a shower. Now, if you know anything about being a kid, in the basement, everything lives. <laughs> Amen? Everything lives in the basement. I mean, monsters, ghosts, ravenous animals, rattlesnakes, everything's in the basement, right? And, and you're like, you need to go down there and take a shower. Well, no, I ain't going down there to take a shower. Is there ain't no way. But if Dad said, I'll go with you, let's go. I ain't worried a bit. Why? Because greater is he that is in, beside me than down there in that basement. And all of a sudden, I get brave. You know what I mean? Why? Because I have somebody on my side. It's time for us to face, change the face of the church. Problems are fact. Worry and fear is a fact. But we need to testify to the world that we have somebody bigger on our side. We have somebody bigger in us. And you want to see people want to come to your church? You want to see people want to get saved? Want to serve you, Jesus? Let them see you walking through a storm with your shoulders back, your chin up, because you know, not because you're somebody, because you know somebody. Amen. That's why. And so the Bible says, number one, we, there is opposition, but then number two, he says, oh, but fear not. Fear not. Then, verse, and then the third thing we need to see is this. Are you ready for this one? Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes. Open his eyes. Now tonight you can sit here all night long and you can say, yeah, that's true, that's true, that's true. But when God opens your eyes and it becomes real to you that God's for you and it becomes real to you that God will get you through, that's when everything changes. It's the eye of faith. It's the eye of faith. Look what he says here. Look in verse number uh, 16. He, he answered and he said, Fear not, for they that be with us are far more than they be with them. Then verse 17, And Elisha prayed and he said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. You could circle that and preach on that all day long. You know why? The first thing is this. You can't open somebody's eyes. Elisha couldn't open his eyes. Elisha could, have, Elisha could have set him down and said, listen, these, we got a thousand chariots to their hundred. He could have tried to convince him. He could have tried to educate him, but it wouldn't have mattered. God only could open his eyes. Right. Only God could open his eyes. And when God opened his eyes, then he could see it. You know, you ever seen somebody lost and you witness to them and witness to them and witness to them and witness to them? And they sit there and they look at you and say, I know I'm lost. I know I'm lost. And I know I need to get saved. And they just sit there. Yeah. Right. I, know, I know I need to get saved. I know that if I died, I'd go to hell. And they just sit there. And they sit there. And they sit there. And you're like, what's the matter with you? Yeah. Then one day, though, when it becomes real to them, yeah. God opens their eyes. Yeah. Let me show you that verse. Turn with me right fast to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is what happened to each one of us one night. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 tells us, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. What's happened? Their minds are blinded. Then he says in verse 4, Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. That's when a person realizes that they need to get saved. It's when they say, hey, I see it. I see it. I understand it. And if you're here tonight, listen to me. If you're here tonight and you've never been saved, you're waiting on a certain feeling. You're waiting on a certain emotion. You're waiting on a certain heartbeat to happen. Listen, if your eyes are open and you know you're lost, that's all you need. You don't need any more than that. That's enough. That's what happened to me the night I got saved. Some people say, yeah, but preacher, that man last night had a magnificent testimony. He said when he walked in that living room, something hit him. And boy, I'm waiting on something to hit me like that. Let me tell you something. There's been a lot of children get saved like Lydia. God just opened their heart. God just opened the heart. Salvation's simple as you seeing the truth. And when you see the truth, the light comes on. Then you take it to our walk with the Lord. Hey, that's been more than one time. I've sat in my living room. I've sat in my study at church, being a pastor. I've been on vacation with my family. I'm minding my own business. No matter where you're at, what happens, the opposition come at you and launch everything against you. And you can't see the truth, can you not? 
No matter, no matter what you know about the Bible, it's like nothing. It's like it's darkness comes over you. Like a darkness, like you're living in oppression and you can feel the evil. You ever been there? I'm talking about being saved, serving God, and you can feel that oppression, whether it's relationships broke your heart, a family situation, a church situation, a physical uh, doctor's report, a financial situation, or just a mind battle, whatever it is. It's just a, a heavy load just weighing on you in such a way that you feel like, I'm about to lose my mind. Amen. And you get there. And you sit there and you sit there and you sit there no matter what you do. It's like, and even if you talk to somebody, no matter what they say, it don't help. And you try to pray and you feel like you're not getting anywhere. And you feel like it don't help. But then God brings a promise back to your mind. And God brings that scripture to your mind. And like the clouds kind of break a little bit. And you get a little bit of ray of sunshine. What just happened to you? God just opened your eyes. God just opened your eyes and you could see it. Has that ever happened to you? That's happened to me before. I've been there. I've been to places where, wow, it's amazing where you think my mind's in different places and that worry and that stress and that depression and all of a sudden everything breaks and the sun starts shining again. It's a glorious place. How many of you have been there? Raise your hand. You know what that's called? That's your Dothan. That's your Dothan. I was once in Dothan. The enemy surrounded me. And I thought there's no hope. And then God showed up. And he was greater and he opened my eyes. And I seen it. That's your Dothan. Brother Vinoy and I had fellowship today. I'm trying to, I'm trying to help him out, church. I'm trying to spend as much time with him. I'm trying to help you out. You need help with this man. Now, he's spiritually right, I believe. Physically, he's doing pretty good. I've been praying for his back. But mentally, we've got work to do. <laughs> and I've been, I've been we're trying, to, uh, trying to give him some intellect and talk to him and fellowship with him today. But as we was fellowshiping today, he was up there in his, his uh, shop behind his house. He started telling me, I don't guess you care for me sharing this. He told me not to tell anybody. No, he didn't. Have to. <laughs> But he started sharing with me about a place he was at in his ministry years ago. And how when it was him and his wife and he had two children. And they got to a really low, low, low place. That was a Dothan. That was a Dothan. And he, boy, he, he shared with me how all of a sudden it wasn't long and God just opened it up. Started pouring out the blessings. The clouds broke. God opened his eyes. You know what happened to him? That was his Dothan. That's what it was. Several of you have one. I still remember three years ago, my dad died August 11th, 2021 from COVID. I still remember. That was one of the darkest few weeks of my life. I'll never forget it. And, and, and my mind was going to me in different ways. And, and my wife knows me better than anybody in here. And Man, the one thing was eating me up. Me and my dad had a great relationship, but the guilt, because he died unexpectedly, and the guilt, and I wish I'd have said this, and I wish I'd have done that, and beat myself up, and beat myself up, and boy, I was going, and I was getting heavy, heavy under it, heavy load. And by the way, when you get down, I show you the first person that's going to show up, Satan. Amen. He's going to jump on with everything he's got. I promise you, if you get down physically, he's going to show up and attack you mentally. If you get down mentally, he's going to show up and jump on you physically. If you get down spiritually, he's coming. He's coming to everything he's got because he wants to destroy you. Don't forget that. Don't ever forget that. And so I remember that. And I was going through that place and going through that place. And finally I got to the point, the light came on. God opened my eyes and let me see some truths. That was my Dothan. Do you see that? Everybody has a Dothan. How, how do you get out of that Dothan? How do you get to that place? Because we have a shield. That's why we have a shield. And that shield does you no good until you hold it up, right? And you shared with me last night, using a dolphin in the hospital, laying on your back. That's a dolphin. And a lot of you have been there. And you know what? And your pastor loves you. And I know he tries to be there for you. But your pastor can't get you out of that dolphin. And your spouse can't get you out of that dolphin. Your parents can't get you out of that dolphin. Only God can get you out of there. 
Only God can open those eyes. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. I want to show you something. Ephesians chapter 6, and this is what I'm trying to get across to you tonight. About that, about that shield. Ephesians chapter 6 talks about the whole armor of God. And it talks about that, uh, that we need to take that whole armor, that we'll be able to stand and have in our, that helmet of salvation and our, and our feet uh, gird, shod with that preparation of the gospel of peace. But look at verse 16. This is one of my favorite ones. Verse 16. It says, above all. In other words, this is very important, he's saying. He says, above all. Verse 16. Take the shield of faith. Wherefore, wherewith you shall be able to quench, circle that. Amen. All, all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the shield of faith. What's the shield of faith? That's what's in your lap. You know how God opens people's eyes today? He illuminates it through his word. He illuminates it. Now, if this is my shield, this is my shield, and you're all my enemy, and you're shooting fiery darts at me, and I've got my shield... It don't help me one bit. And I know it. And I know all about this shield. And I've got 15 cop, 15 shields laying around my house. It helps me no, it doesn't help me at all. Yeah. You know the only way that shield will help me? Is by faith. I hold it up. By faith. Yeah. By faith. Yeah. I hold it up. Listen, Satan's tried to convince me that God ain't even real before. I'm going to share something with you. I'm going to share this with you. I remember, I remember I was pastor of a church, and man, that thing grew, took off like wildfire. First Wednesday night I preached at that church, there's, I think, seven, maybe ten people there. And I preached. Man, I was so eager to preach, I didn't care whether there's two or 22, or 222. I was ready to preach, and I preached. They didn't have a pastor. A few weeks go by, and they said, would you preach on Sunday? I said, man, yeah, I'll preach on Sunday. I preached again. And before long, they called me to pastor. And I became pastor, and man, it grew like crazy. Filled up, people getting saved. We knocked the back wall out because it's filled up. Then we, then we filled that up, and we went next door and built a new church, filled that up, knocked the back wall out. Now just growing like crazy. But I, in the midst of all that growth, I still remember a person passed away that was friends with a person in our church. Passed away. And I remember I had to ride with the pastor to our seniors and one of his best friends, I had to ride with them about an hour away to do a funeral. And I rode with them down there. And here I'm standing there. I'm the leader of the, one of the fastest growing churches in Western North Carolina. I've been to Bible college, had my doctorate degree. And I'm standing at the graveside. Standing at the graveside. And I'm supposed to read the scriptures. And I'm reading the scriptures. And guess what starts going through my mind? Well, I'm talking about very real, almost like an audible voice just piercing me. Do you really believe that that person's going to come out of that grave? That's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. And boy, it some gripped me, and I was, I was miserable. Miserable. You say, oh, I sure would admit it. It's happened to you, too. Miserable. And I started thinking, great day. I'm the biggest hypocrite on this graveside. What's wrong with me? How can a thought like that come through my mind? I'll tell you how it can come through your mind. Because you have an opposition. You have an enemy. And guess who's picking on more than anybody? You, if you're trying to serve the Lord. And here you're sitting out Wednesday, or Tuesday night at Revival. I'm going to tell you who's picking on. This is the crowd he's picking on. This is the crowd he can't stand. That Sunday morning crowd that comes once every six months, they don't bother him. That's right. That crowd that don't ever witness to anybody, he ain't worried about them. But that crowd that wants to see somebody saved and trying to pray and trying to witness and trying to see God move here, that's the crowd he's going to attack them with everything he's got. And boy, he attacked me. And here he come. And let me tell you, I only had one choice. One choice. I couldn't have went and talked to another preacher and them helped me. I couldn't have went home and talked to my wife and she convinced me. I couldn't have had any conversation with that. I only had one choice. That says to be absent with the body, be present with the Lord. That says when the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise. That says that Jesus 
truly bodily rose from the grave and he was the first fruits of all that shall believe. And boy, I took that shield of faith and whew, that's the only protection I had. And guess what? That was my Dothan. That was one of many times I've been in Dothan. How many Dothans you been in? A bunch, probably. The longer you serve him, the more Dothans you'll go to. But every time I go to Dothan and get there, God never fails to show up. He never fails to show up. And tonight I'm preaching to some ladies and I'm preaching to some men. Your mind's about to get the best of you and you're about to go under. You better listen to me. You can talk about salvation. You can talk about sanctification. But until you get that shield and start holding it up and taking in promises of the Word of God, I'm not looking for rationalizing. I'm not looking for education. I'm looking for faith. Amen. And I'm holding that shield of faith up and it starts quenching all that stuff. That's when the victory comes and the clouds roll. Amen. That's when he opens my eyes that I may see. Amen. That's your Dothan. That's your Dothan. You say, I thought this was revival. This, you will have revival when you learn to use that shield. Because I promise you something. When this meeting closes and you go back to work, somebody's waiting on you. I promise you something. In about 15 days when I get on that airplane and I'm flying 16 hours across the Atlantic Ocean and I'm miserable, I hate flying. And Sandra gives me 14 melatonin trying to knock me out. You know what I'm talking about. And I'm sitting there on that plane and miserable. I tell you, I guarantee you it. He's going to show up. He's going to start again. I'm going to land in them dusty villages in Mozambique. He's going to start again. He'll start somewhere, somehow on that journey. I guarantee you he'll start. But there's a Dothan. And every time I get there, I only got one choice. See, this right here is the best weapon you've got. This is the only defense you have. This is it. This is your defense. So tonight, you know what I'm trying to tell you? Use your shield. Use your shield. Because if you don't use your shield, you're going to be saved, going to heaven, miserable. No victory, no joy. Just as sure as Satan tried to kill the Christians, just as sure as Satan had that unholy mixture with the Roman Empire and the Christianity, Satan is attacking the minds in 2024 of the people of God, and he's wearing us out. Amen. He's wearing us out. And you can read 15 books on how to have peace. You can read 20 books on how to have joy. None of them are going to help you until you actively hold up the shield of faith. Amen. It's not going to help you. But I got to give you a P.S. tonight. Because we could all leave here saying, glory to God, I'll go to Dothan and God will get me out. Hallelujah. Let's shout the house down and go home. But there's something you need to know. Dothan's mentioned twice in the Bible. Twice. We find in 2 Kings chapter 6, right here, where Elisha and the man of God, they're in Dothan. They're surrounded by the enemy. God sends the heavenly host and delivers them. But there's another Dothan. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37 is the only other time Dothan is mentioned. And again we see the man of God, the servant of God, falling into enemy territory. Dothan. Don't ever forget that word tonight. Dothan is the place where you will be attacked. Dothan is the place where the people of God are serving God and get surrounded. There's another one, Genesis chapter 37. You ever heard of a man named Joseph? Joseph was chosen by God. Joseph was favored by his dad. Joseph had that coat of many colors that his dad gave him. Joseph had dreamed a dream. God had gave him something and said, Joseph, you're going to be the one who's going to lead your brothers. Joseph, you're going to be the one who's going to be the savior of Israel when famine comes. You're going to be the one that's going to rescue your dad. Joseph, you're the chosen by God. Joseph, you're the one. But Joseph has a confidence. Joseph has a shout. Let's just say Joseph had a revival. Yeah. Right? So Joseph has something from God. He has a word from God. Then the Bible says in Genesis chapter number 37, that in verse number 14, that, that his, his uh, dad said to him, verse 14, Go, I pray thee, and see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So Joseph's dad sent him out. 
He said, I'm, I don't need you to go down there and find your brothers and see if they're well. Joseph is 17 years old at this time. 17 years old trying to serve God. The Bible says that he sent him out of the veil of Hebron and he came to Shechem. Verse 15, and he found a certain man, a certain man found him and behold, he was wandering in the field and the man asked him saying, why seekest thou? Verse 16, and he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, they are departed hence, for I heard them say, let us go to where? Where? Let's go to Dothan. So where's Joseph go? Joseph's going to Dothan. Why is Joseph going to Dothan? Because God chose him, and he's going to see his brothers just like his dad told him. He said, I'm going down there to Dothan. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. Guess what happens when Joseph gets to Dothan? The enemy surrounds him. Who's the enemy? His own brothers. By the way, you never know where the opposition's coming from. That's true. Right? You never know. And I'm not getting you to try to turn on church people, but it could come with only people you call brothers and sisters in Christ. It could come from your own blood family. You don't know where it's coming from. But here goes Joseph the Dothan. Next thing you know, he's got the joy of the Lord in his heart. He's fired up. He says, God's given me a dream. This is wonderful. His brothers surround him. They come up with a plot and they strip him of his coat and they cast him into a pit. And what did they do to him? Sold him into slavery. Guess who bought him? Potiphar bought him. And he became Potiphar's slave. And then Potiphar's wife falsely accused him. Remember that? After Potiphar's wife falsely accused him, Potiphar turned on him. Guess what he does to Joseph? Cast him in a dungeon. Cast him in prison. So here goes Joseph. He was living for the Lord, minding his own business, trying to serve God. He gets to Dothan, falls into the hands of the enemy. Is Dothan real? Absolutely it's real. It's as old as Genesis. There's an enemy that comes against the people of God. Especially those who are trying to live for the Lord. So Joseph falls into Dothan. Those enemies surround him. He gets sold in and then he dreams a dream and he tells the butler. He says, you're going to be delivered when you get delivered. Remember me and speak kindly of me. And he gets, even gets betrayed by the butler. That's what I'm trying to get to you about Joseph's Dothan. He eventually gets delivered. And then he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He gets out of his Dothan. Why? Because we always get out of Dothan. Listen to me. You always get out. The Bible says in Peter that after you've suffered a while, the Lord will establish you, strengthen you, settle you. You always get out of Dothan. But here's the thing that makes me nervous. You never know how long you're going to be there. You don't know. Guess how long Joseph was there? 13 years. 13 years in Dothan. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 37, he was 17 years old. 17 years old when he went to feed, or when he went to his brethren. And then the Bible says later on that he was 30 years old when he stood before uh, the Pharaoh and he turned him loose. 13 years in Dothan. Don't you imagine Joseph thought this? God, where are you? God, what's happened? God, I've prayed. God, I've trusted. God, where are you? Where are you? Why ain't you answering my prayer? Why ain't you delivering me? Then he probably went to a Baptist church, sat there miserable while the people singing the house down, shouting, glorifying the Lord. Then he probably heard a man stand up over here and say, boy, I was once under a battle and I prayed and God delivered me. Then he's had the man stand up, lady stand up over here and say, boy, I was going through hell by the acre and I prayed, God delivered me. And Joseph's saying, Lord, why not me? 13 years. You don't imagine he prayed in that prison and tried to ring the prayer bells of heaven? But I promise you this, God never forsook him. And God's promises were as true to Joseph every day for 13 years as they were for Elisha when it only lasted one night. They were just as true and just as sure. You say, what are you trying to get to tonight, preacher? I don't know how long Dothan lasts, but I can tell you there's victory even in the prison. And there's victory even in the storm. And there's victory even when it feels like God's a million miles away. And there's victory when you can't feel him. There's victory when you can't hear him. That word is as true 
as true, as true as it is when you're shouting the house down as it is when you can't find him. But I promise you something tonight, Dothan is real. And the shield is real. And the shield works. And tonight, I want all of you to be able to say, Oh God, help me to trust your promises. To lean on your promises. Oh, how precious are the promises. How precious. Let me give you this and I'm done. Turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter. If you would, come and play that for me. Sister, look at 1 Peter. I want to show you this. I shared with you that me and Sandra was able to go to Ephesus. See where Peter made, or where Paul, he made those tents. I was able, I was able to see that amphitheater. That amphitheater where, where Paul, after he had preached, and those people got angry, and they said, they said, we're, we're here to make the, make the gods, make the shrines to the God of, of Diana, and you're robbing us. And they had that big uproar, and they rushed in the amphitheater. I was able to see that amphitheater. And that makes you faith. I mean, it's, it's exciting to see those places. And those cobblestone streets are the same ones Paul walked on. And it's exciting to see. And then we went to Rome. And went to Rome, we got to go to this specific place. Listen to me. Specific place. That's in this, now they, got, they built this like Catholic church over it. But there's a hole in the ground. And we went to that Catholic church and we got to, we, we paid just a little bit of money to go in it and to, to go down and see that place. And we walked down these stairs and there's a spiral staircase. It goes down in the dungeon. And there's no natural light down there. And at that time there was no staircase. It was just a dungeon. And it's, 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 a, it's a hulled out rock cave is what it is. And in the top of that rock cave, you're down there probably as tall or taller than that ceiling right there. And it's dark and damp and moist down there. And in the top of that rock cave, there's a hole cut in about that big around. You know what they used to do those prisoners? They used to lower them down in there. And they put them in that cave to die. Guess who was in that very same cave that I was standing in? Peter. That's the place that Peter was. Spent his last days. So I'm sitting down in there, and, and it's dark, and it's damp, and the floor's wet. And I'm thinking about Peter's in there. That's where Peter was. Peter, that's where he spent his last days. I'm going to show you how real the shield is and how real Dothan is. Peter wrote this book as he was getting ready to die. Imagine thinking about going to that kind of Dothan. That kind of Dothan will, that'll distract you, that'll discourage you. Peter probably thought, I've preached, I preached on the day of Pentecost, I've done all these things, and now here I am. God, have you forsaken me? Maybe he thought that, but I don't think he did. You know why I don't think he did? Because he penned 2 Peter. 2 Peter is the last book you wrote before he died. You know what he says? Look at verse number 13. Peter says, Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. It is tabernacle means as long as I'm in this body, I'm going to write this because I, I want to stir you up. He says, verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. Peter says, I know I'm going to die. Shortly I'm going to put off this tabernacle. And then he says, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. <laughs> Could you imagine? Peter's in a prison. Peter's in a dungeon. He's getting ready to die. You know what he says? I believe this book so much that I've not followed cunningly devised fables. He says, when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus, but we were eyewitness of his majesty. You know what Peter's thinking while he's in that prison? Satan's shooting fiery darts at me. My body's weary. I'm hungry. I'm cold. I'm wet. I'm miserable. I miss my family. I feel like God's a million miles away. But I know what I saw. Amen. I know what I saw. I saw him alive and well. Amen. I saw him walk on the water. I saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration. I know what I saw. Satan, you ain't going to convince me otherwise. But listen to what else what he says. He says, we were eyewitnesses. Then he says, verse 17, for we have received from God uh, the Father honor and glory. For he received, talking about Jesus Christ, whom there came 
uh, with such a loud voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom well pleased. He said, I not only saw him, I heard it. I heard it. I heard the father say, this is my beloved son. You couldn't convince Peter otherwise. What if we had that much faith in the house of God today? When Satan starts attacking you, you wouldn't budge. Well, I know what I saw and I know what I heard. You ain't going to convince me otherwise. He's alive and well. And he's got the keys of death, hell, and the grave. But listen to what Peter says. He says, in verse number 18, this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. In other words, he says, I heard it. Verse 19 is one of my favorite verses in the whole New Testament. Amen. And we also have a more sure word of prophecy. Wherein too, ye do well that ye take heed. What's he talking about? I have something better than I saw him. I have something better than I heard. I have this. Peter said it himself. Can you believe that? Some people say, boy, if I could see him, I'd be all right. If I could hear his voice, I'd be all right. No, you wouldn't. You have something better than seeing him. You have something better than anything. You have the written word of God that's proved itself over and over and over. It's proved itself. That's what he says. He says we have a more sure word of prophecy. That's what he said. We've proved it over and over and over. And I'm preaching myself tonight too because I know Satan's going to fight and I know he's going to attack and I know he's going to put me under back more discouragement, but I have a shield. It's a shield that's more sure than seeing him. It's a shield more word, more, more sure than hearing him. I have something that I can stand on. I have something that I can trust. I have something I can believe on. This is where my peace comes from. This is where my assurance comes from. This is where my reason for living comes from. This is the foundation of everything we are. You want me to tell you why Satan's attacking it? Because he knows that's the only hope we got. This is it. And just as sure as the last just sold that man of God in 2 Kings chapter 6, he said, look, if you could see it, Lord, open his eyes. And when he opened his eyes, that man of God said, we don't have anything to worry about. There are far more for us than against us. You know what my word is to you tonight? If you could see it. If you could see it. Lord, open their eyes. Open their eyes. They wouldn't be a discouraged saint in the church. They wouldn't be a defeated saint in the church. Satan's going to keep attacking. And this is going to keep proving true. Over and over and over. So tonight, if you're in your Dothan, take up your shield. It works. It works. It works. It works. I ask you, if you would play that, I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. I cannot bear these burdens alone. While she's playing that, I mentioned my dad a while ago. He was an old country. He really didn't know how to sing, but he only knew one way to sing. He'd open his eyes and just, la, 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 la. He used to sing this song. It's blessed my heart more than once. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in this excellent word. Listen, what more can he say than to you he hath said? Ye who unto Jesus for refuge have fled. I can't wait to get to heaven and hear him sing it one more time. How firm a foundation. Oh, how firm. Where is it laid? In his excellent word. It's proved itself over and over, time and time again. I'm preaching to the church tonight. I'm preaching to the workers. I'm preaching to the ladies and the men. You're trying to serve God. You're trying to live for God. And you're under that heavy load. May God lift your load tonight. Not because you hear a sweet song. Not because somebody patted you on the back. But because God opened your eyes. You can see the promises in his word that it stands true. Let's bow our heads. As she plays that, the walk tonight continues. Started with salvation. We get closer through sanctification. But then, we get a little peace and a little joy by knowing we have a shield. A shield that works. As she plays that, I must tell Jesus, 
I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear these burdens alone. I can't bear them alone. And you'll never bear them alone. You say, preacher, I'm in Dothan. I just need to know how long I'm going to be here. It don't matter. You'll have joy in the midst of it if you take that shield up. you have peace in the midst of it if you take that shield up. Lord, you ought to pray tonight, God, open my eyes. And may I trust the shield like never before. Don't wait for your circumstances to change. You could be in that situation for years, but you can have joy in the midst of it. Ladies, men, I ask you a question tonight with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I want to hood say, Preacher, I'm in a Dothan right now. I know we're having a revival, but I'm a servant of God. And I'm a child of God. And I know what you're talking about, that opposition. And I'm there. I'm in a Dothan. And I need some help. Would you slip your hand up, honest before God? God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Wow. Hallelujah. God's in the building. And he wants to, hey, hey, listen, he wants to lift some burdens tonight. I must tell Jesus all my trials. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. While she's playing that, let's all stand with our heads bowed. You that raised your hand, you that didn't. Let's just do business with God for a few minutes tonight. God, help me to trust the shield. Help me open my eyes, Lord. Give me the victory. Give me the joy. Give me the peace that only you can give. Ladies, men, young people, whoever you are, God's speaking to your heart. Will you just mind him tonight? Will you obey him? Will you obey him? If you're here tonight and you've never been saved, oh, may God, he's, he's already opened your eyes. That's the reason you know you're lost. He's already opened your eyes. Won't you slip out and come?